we are talking about how to make your arguments really persuasive. And basically, I mean, you've done so well this week. You've covered so much. And all of the, um, the faculty that have been talking have been saying about how impressed we are at how you've taken to this format. And for some of you, how you've taken to debating. We've never debated before. And there's a lot of things now that you're doing, or, or even if you haven't done them every time, um, you've done them kind of at least once and you know what you're working towards, that you understand now about the different roles on the table and what you have to do in different speeches. Almost everyone's really getting the sense now of those speaking structures and those introductions and having those different points um, and the conclusions. And you're starting to do a good job of recognising what sorts of arguments you need to identify during the preparation time and the debate um, in terms of thinking about what things you actually need to do to prove a case or if you're in the opposition, what you need to disprove and thinking about how that generates different types of arguments about need, about workability, um, about justification, um, about benefits and disadvantages and all the different causes and links that are coming through that. So what we're going to talk about this morning, and this is not just something to do with debating, so for those of you who are more interested in the general effect of speaking, this is key to any type of persuasive speaking that you're doing. We're going to think once you're in that situation, you're in your speech, you've chosen your three arguments, and very good arguments they are too that you've chosen. We're going to think, how are you going to make each one of those individual arguments as persuasively as you possibly can? And how are you going to make that argument have as high an impact on your audience and on your judges and really become an argument which you think you're going to get getting good marks in terms of matter and manner um, and that, uh, that argument's really going to stand and be persuasive during the debate. So that's what we're going to be thinking about here. And I want you to think when you think about this that there's no doubt, is there, this is what I kind of uh, wrote down in my thinking, you know, there's no doubt that when you hear two people make exactly the same argument, that one of them will sometimes be more persuasive than the other. So there must be something more than just selecting the right argument in that sense. And even sometimes if those two speakers are both going through the right three steps of the assertion, the label, some kind of reasoning and explanation, and some kind of evidence, even when two speakers are following those three steps. Still, we'll lean towards one speaker and just say, but we just think that they're making that argument in a more effective way or a more persuasive way. And, that's, and there are a variety of different ways and different schools of thoughts about how you might take that argument that you've got and make it as persuasive as possible. And I'm just gonna go through one way with you this morning that you can think about try and help you maximise the impact of the argument that you're going to make. And what we're going to do um, is we're going to talk about three parts of, um, of an argument. Um, and it's really, it's really three parts of reasoning, although sometimes in this the evidence and the reasoning are going to become intertwined um, so that you can't necessarily say, this is my reasoning and now I've done my reasoning here's my example or evidence, they're going to be a little bit more um, entwined. We're really talking about how you can make your reasoning um, as effective as possible. And I want to start off just by giving you kind of two examples um, of kind of the same argument, the second of which I think is going to, I'm, it's going to be me trying to make it in a more persuasive way, um, and, uh, and, I, and I hope you'll agree that it's more persuasive, because otherwise you might not want to listen to the rest of what I've got to say um, for the next <laughs> half hour in that sense. And then we'll talk about breaking that down and thinking about what might I be doing, what steps might I be going through in the second one that makes it more persuasive than the first one. And the argument I want us to think about is we're in an argument about um, violence in video games, okay, and censoring violence in video games or banning violence in video games. And the proposition um, wants to put forward an argument that um, we don't want to live in the sort of society that has um, violence as part of entertainment in that sense. So this isn't, you, you often get in this debate an argument that violent, that people play violent video games will actually lead to them going out and committing these horrific murders and things. This isn't that argument. This is the argument that says, even if the person doesn't go out and commit the murder um, because they played it, we just think it's wrong on some level in this sense, okay? Um, so number one, this is the first one. So ladies and gentlemen, my next argument is that even if we don't find that everybody who plays these games goes out and commits murders, we actually just think that the presence of violence in these games is wrong. And the reason that we think this is because we think that if there's something in society that we say is wrong, and that we try to deter, and that we don't condone, then it undermines that message if in your video games 
um, you, you, you're allowed to have that and you're allowed to see it and be part of it and even be rewarded for it within entertainment. We think that sends out a mixed message and that's why it's wrong to have the violence in the games. Okay? So that's the first argument. It's not a bad argument. I hope you don't think it's a bad argument. It's a decent um, argument that you can put forward within this debate. We're going to make it again, and I'm going to make an effort to have a higher impact with this, with this argument and this sense that it's wrong. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, my next argument is that we don't want to live in the kind of society that condones violence as part of entertainment. And the principle behind this is that we see in society, if something is out there and is condemned, and we try and raise our children to think that something is wrong and immoral, then we shouldn't condone it within entertainment. Because if we do this, what we'll see is we'll lead to a general acceptance of this wrong thing, this bad thing within society. It will start to break down and blur our social norms, send out mixed messages, and lead to a desensitization um, of violence within society. So if, ladies and gentlemen, you're playing, you're sitting and you're playing um, a game, so you're playing Grand Theft Auto, and you're in a situation where if you beat a woman to death with a baseball bat, and as you do this, technology is very good now, it's very graphic, she looks like a real woman, the blood looks real, ladies and gentlemen, that's how you win the game. That's how you get points. That's what you're sitting down on a Saturday evening to try and promote. And we think that as you do this, what you actually start doing is you start blurring messages, you start changing people's mindsets, and you start changing the ethical framework of society by allowing this to happen. Now we see, ladies and gentlemen, there are all sorts of things in, that we condemn in society that we would never allow um, young people or people in general to be playing as part of games. We don't have games out there, ladies and gentlemen, where the more heroin you can inject into your veins in the quicker period of time, the more points you get and the more likely you are to win that game. We wouldn't think it was acceptable if there was a computer game on the market where you got points for the more women that you could rape as you walked around your simulated city. The reason why we don't want these things and don't accept these things is they're not things that we accept within society and we don't want to promote them within entertainment. We think brutal beatings and murders come under the same category and we think it's time we start treating them like that and stopping this desensitization of violence within our society. And that's why we should ban violence in these games. Okay? Is there any different for that sense? Firstly, it's important to get it at the sense. All right, hands up if you thought that the first one was a more persuasive, high impact argument. Okay, good. Hands up if you thought the second one was. Okay, good. All right, that's okay. I don't have to stop lecturing now at this stage. Um, what I want to do then is to break that down and think what was it about, what was I doing in the second one um, that I wasn't doing in the first one to add? It was exactly the same argument, okay? But what was I doing with the analysis? in terms of, of pushing it forward and making it more persuasive and more um, um, high impact. And I think that there are three things you can do in an argument, okay, three parts of an argument that you can put together to make it really persuasive. Okay, I'm going to say that you're going to chunk up and then you're going to chunk down and then you're going to chunk sideways. <laughs> Do these mean anything to you, these phrases? No. Do you know what I mean when I talk about chunking up and chunking down and things? It's a good throwing up. <laughs> yeah, you're not throwing up. I'm not going to ask you to throw up in that sense. The idea of chunking as a principle is the idea of how general versus how specific are you speaking. All right? So the more you chunk up, the more general your points are becoming. And then the more you chunk down, the more specific they're becoming. And then if you chunk sideways, you're staying at the same level of specificity. Um, so for example, um, if I um, was talking about um, uh, fruit, okay, I might have fruit as a level here. To chunk up from fruit, um, I might go up to food, okay, and then chunk back down to fruit. And then if I want to chunk down again, I could chunk down to berries. And then if I want to chunk down again, I could chunk down to blueberries. Okay, so it's about a level of specificity as we go through things. <coughs> and I'm going to say to you today that I think to try and make your argument as persuasive as possible, you want to think about these different levels of specificity that you're making. So when you chunk up, 
in an argument. This is when you're putting across the analysis of the general theory or principle that supports the argument that you're making. All right? The cleverer and the more intellectual you are, the more you can do with your chunking up bit. All right? If you're the sort of person that, uh, that knows lots about the, sort of, you know, the theory of how states act in IR or something, before you go on to make a really specific point, you might be talking about your theory in this sense, or a psychological theory, or just about the general principle that we have. So in the video um, games debate that, um, uh, that we were just doing there, I didn't have a particularly clever point, I don't tend to, uh, but I've just kind of talked about, instead of going straight into talking about violence in video games, I had this general point of, we think that if there are things that you don't condone in society, you shouldn't condone them in entertainment. I haven't actually said anything about violence there or video games. I've chunked it up to a more general idea that I want people to agree with in that sense. Okay? If you do choose to go for something more intellectual than that, for, um, for, for some theory or something, then there are some sort of rules about how you should do that. You should do it very briefly. You shouldn't waste time talking a lot about this kind of general theory in this sense. So it needs to be brief and to the point, and it needs to be put in, a re in really clear and direct language. Okay? So don't think that it's okay for you to use all of these really kind of critical terms and just assume um, that all of your judges and audience will necessarily understand what you're talking about. You can talk theoretically, but make sure you do it in very clear and direct language. So this is your chunking up bit of your argument. Now lots of people, I think, never end up then chunking down. They're making this sort of general point, and then they just kind of go straight from that to sort of saying, right, and so that's where we should ban violence in video games. It's obvious, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? I've told you my theory, and I've now told you my conclusion, um, and surely only an imbecile wouldn't be able to see why my general theory led to my specific conclusion of this argument. All right? But really, what you need to do to make your argument really persuasive is to imagine that if you want that everyone is imbeciles, and that they do need you to take them through from how that general point and your general principle and theory works, and actually make it crystal clear how that applies to the very specific situation you're talking about in terms of the motion. So that's when you need to chunk down. Okay, and when you chunk down is when you start talking to me. Chunk, when you're chunking up, you could be talking in quite abstract theoretical terms. Okay, you could be using abstract nouns, for example, in the way that you're talking. When you chunk down, you're now talking in concrete nouns. So we'll know the difference between abstract nouns and concrete nouns, yeah? Abstract nouns are things you can't touch, things like liberty and justice and love, and concrete nouns, you know, the table and the coffee um, and the ceiling, they're, they're, they're real things that you can touch. And so what you're doing when you're chunking nouns, you're taking, you know, the, the abstract the theoretical general point that you've made, and you're bringing it down to what it really means in real concrete terms and in the debate. And often it's good if you're, when you're chunking down, we've talked about this, this is when it becomes reasoning and evidence start to become a little bit blurred. We talked about the fact that one of your forms of evidence in a point could be visualization, okay? I think it's really good to mix that up with your reasoning. As you're taking your reasoning from a general level down to a specific level, as you're chunking down, this can be really powerful and persuasive if that's done in a very visual way. So by the end of it, they can really think, yeah, okay, we're not just this isn't some general point about violence. This is violence bad. Okay, violence isn't something that we can picture. You can picture somebody beating somebody to death with a baseball bat. All right, it's a visual, concrete thing that you can picture. So try and bring it down to something concrete, real, and visual as you chunk down. Now, if you have chunking up and chunking down in your point, you can be done. Okay, you've done the two things that you need to do in order to be able to lead to your conclusion. So you could go straight from your general point, your major theory, convince people of the principle, you've convinced them that this principle is directly relevant in this particular case by telling them about the concrete um, visual things um, about how it works in this case. You can then, if you want, finish your point, lead to the conclusion of your point. But if you do that, then you don't do, for, which what is for me my favorite part of an argument, which is chunking sideways, okay? You can't chunk sideways in every argument, but I think every argument where you can tends to make a more effective um, argument that's harder to sort of come back on at that stage. And the chunking sideways is the analogy. Okay? 
So within the debate that we had here, the chunking up was a general point. We don't condone things um, that we don't like in entertainment. The chunking down was talking about the specifics of violence within the game. It was talking about um, Grand Theft Auto and, and how that um, affected um, the way we see violence. My chunking sideways was when I started to talk about how we wouldn't think it was acceptable to have you know, injecting heroin and raping in games. Okay? I was trying to see, can I draw some, some kind of comparison, some kind of analogy with something that will support my side and get people to say, well, that is true. We don't do that, so maybe we shouldn't do this as well. And well, we do do that, so yeah, that does seem to be on the same kind of line. That is inconsistent that we have this in that way. So if you can think of a way to chunk sideways, I think you just get that extra bit of, um, of sort of analysis, those, those extra things. And then you're kind of forcing the other side to come back and say, well, this is why we think that, that you know, um, uh, beating a woman to death is different from, from raping a woman. They're then in a situation where they have to um, make that distinction. It's not that they won't be able to necessarily. Often analogies are um, attacked and, um, and, and um, rebutted by the other side. But just because something can be rebutted doesn't mean that you shouldn't put it forward in the first place. Okay, so chunking up, chunking down, chunking sideways. I'm going to give you another example. Okay, so you can see how this works in a few different debates. We're going to go through a few different ones. So you can see how chunking up, chunking down, chunking sideways. But to imagine we're in a debate, affirmative action for women in top business positions is the debate. Okay, that we should have affirmative action to get women into top business positions. And the argument that you come up with, good argument, you're all very good at argument selection, the argument that you've come up with is that we need to change the kind of uh, macho boys club um, atmosphere of the boardroom, okay, in order to, um, to, um, to, to promote equality. So the straightforward way of making that argument, yeah, um, is to say um, what we see as a situation at the moment is because men have always dominated the boardroom, business practices have built up um, around men and the way they do things. Um, the result of that is it's now very difficult um, for women to break into that um, atmosphere. They can feel excluded from it. Um, they can feel degraded by it. Um, and ultimately, they can be deferred from wanting um, to, to even put themselves forward into it. OK? Good argument. Good argument about why one of the reasons why, um, even though uh, women are, um, are uh, doing much better in business, that they might be underrepresented at the top level. But let's do it chunked up, chunked down, and chunked sideways. You can see how it works. Start thinking in your own head, kind of like, okay, how would I do that? How would I do sort of up, and what would my down be, and how would I go sideways? See if you can kind of get the mind in sense. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, the next reason why we say you have to have affirmative action is you, if you want to change things is because you have to find a way of changing that boys' club um, macho atmosphere of the boardroom. And what's happened, ladies and gentlemen, is if you allow one group to set the ethos over a really long period of time, then what happens is that ethos then reflects the norms and the values and the behaviour of that particular group, and it excludes others. Either excludes them um, because it actually acts as a barrier to them for them to be able to participate um, and advance within that area, or, even worse, it excludes them by putting them off from even wanting to try. Well, how do we see this in practice, ladies and gentlemen, in the business world? What's it like in the boardrooms of the top uh, businesses in our country? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we think that you see a degrading attitude to women. We think you see sexist jokes and attitudes towards secretaries. We think you see business deals being done on the golf course, and we think you see hospitality being given at the strip clubs, ladies and gentlemen. And we think that as long as this remains, and as long as we have this long hours, hard drinking culture at the top of business, there is always going to be an inherent discrimination towards women, ladies and gentlemen. And what we say is that you have to remove that to allow a fair and equal opportunity for women to have access to their boss, for women to feel comfortable within business, and for women not to be put off from wanting to go anywhere near it in the first place. I mean, imagine if this was the other way around, ladies and gentlemen. Imagine if you had situations where, for a long period of time, uh, women had 
um, always been running a particular um, issue. And suddenly now men wanted, after a period of time, to, to get in there, ladies and gentlemen. How would you feel as a man if suddenly you felt that in order to succeed and get forward um, in your business, you saw that important deals were being done um, in beauty parlours? Um, over waxing and, uh, and manicures, ladies and gentlemen. How would you feel if you felt that you had to have you know, an intimate knowledge of high fashion um, in order to, um, to, to be discussing things in that sense? And how would you feel if staff parties uh, were happening at male strip clubs? <laughs> it wouldn't be accepted, ladies and gentlemen. We could see that it would be in a way that would be excluding and discriminatory. But that's the situation that we actually have in today's society with a male-dominated boardroom. And it's something that it's time we did something about. Okay? So the chunking up, make the general idea, the general principle, why is it that something can be discriminatory, that things can build up in a certain way, chunk it down, talk to me, convince me that this is true, that in the real world, we are living in this macho situation, tell me what it means, don't just tell me, oh, there's this machoistic, <coughs> atmosphere, tell me about, um, you know, people slapping secretaries on the bum or going to strip clubs or, um, or, or doing things in a way that you can tell me what the actual concrete things are that you can visualise in that sense, and then give me an analogy. Not the best analogy in the world in this one, this was a kind of imagined um, analogy, a kind of sideways um, thing in, in that sense. As I say, there's often kind of a way of finding one in this sense. All right, I want you to have a go at doing one now. Okay? Give you a chance. The debate is that we should legalize cannabis, legalize marijuana. You're on the opposition, and the argument that you want to put forward, you know that every single person that debates this, no matter what room they're in, if they're the most novice debater in the world, or they're the world champion, is going to come up with this argument, is the argument that marijuana is bad for you, bad for your health. Okay, so if everyone's going to come up with this argument, you need to be able to show and distinguish yourself by making the argument the best, and in the best possible way. So have a go, have a think to yourself, make the notes that you need to make, think how would you do that? You're chunked up, you're chunked down, and then you're chunked sideways. Marijuana is bad for your health. You mean like being the, the opposition or the opposition? No, you're the opposition. You're saying the reason why we should not legalize marijuana is because it's bad for your health. You can start by saying that. Uh, okay, wait a second, I'm just going to give everyone a chance to. <laughs> you want to think? Yeah, this is. You have to think. You've got to think about it. You've got to think about it. Because it's think about it. It's a problem. Thank you. Gonzalo, do you want to volunteer to do this? Uh, the whole argument, chunk up, chunk down, chunk sideways. All right, come forward. All right, come right forward. showing uh, the bad effects on health of, of these drugs. They were banned because the uh, alcohol industry and the tobacco industry pay more to the government in order to ban all other drugs. This is why we think marijuana, cocaine, and heroin are wrong. Actually, there is no scientific study that shows that marijuana has a bad effect on health. <laughs> They're simply like that. Uh, another Calpino, uh, 
Pinel, uh, 2000, that has two PhDs on this subject, verifies it. And this is why we shouldn't accept, we should, we should accept my one. I can get sideways for me. Can you get sideways to an analogy? All right, because let's say that tomorrow, uh, somehow say, people say that, uh, mm, Coke is bad for your health because it makes you fat. You go like, uh, everything makes you fat. Do we really prohibit it? So this, uh, it's such an economic manipulation of the thing. We cannot allow them to continue prohibiting these uh, products in such <coughs> a, a wrong way. They have to have scientific evidence behind it. All right. Thank you. Yeah. There. We got the we got the argument that that, um, that marijuana is not bad for your health, and um, rather than it is. But he did go through the, the situations. He talk, talked about the sort of broad principle about drugs in general and how they weren't bad for your health. Brought it down to marijuana and talked about particular um, studies, and then took it sideways to look at um, at, at other things that we didn't ban uh, within society. Does anyone have want to have a go? Almost just the rebuttal of that of doing the marijuana is bad for your health. Yep. Yeah. Okay, up the cup. Round of applause, everyone. Um, hey, my name is Paul Fisher, um, and uh, I'm here to talk to you about the uh, weed marijuana. And uh, marijuana has been scientifically proven to damage major, major organs in your body and your central nervous system as a whole. By the time you're older, your sexual reproductive system can be completely destroyed from heavy use of marijuana. This has been proven in scientific facts. Now imagine, ladies and gentlemen, if there was a weight gain or weight loss chemicals endorsed by the FDA that gave you similar um, problems. What if every fat person in the country were prescribed amphetamines or methamphetamines at willy-nilly, not even regarding the damage it does to their central nervous system? A legalization of the drug weed would represent a deterioration in health and the standards of the FDA as we know. Good, well done. Okay, all right, that was really good on the chunk down level, okay? It was really specific about marijuana. It talked to me about very specific. It didn't just say, oh, marijuana's got lots of bad health things to do with it. It talked to me very specifically about the, the problems um, with marijuana. Um, and it did a good chunk sideways um, to go um, to talk about um, this, this idea of um, weight loss drugs um, and amphetamines and things in that sense. Um, right at the end, you sort of started to do a thing about chunking up, where you talked about how this would lead to a general um, uh, kind of degradation of health and the FDA. Um, but it might have been worth starting with this kind of general sense of, of sort of, you know, establishing, um, you know, if a substance has serious health um, problems with it um, then, uh, and is addictive, then those are the principles behind which we keep something illegal. Does marijuana fulfill these two criteria? Yes, it does. Here are the health problems. Here, you know, and, and it's addictive. And then go in that sense. It is worth trying to establish the sort of general... Um, the general idea behind your point before you go straight into the specifics, but the specifics were really good in that sense. Um, okay, we've got time to do one more. Let's go back to the debate that we started the week with, selling organs. <coughs> okay, the debate is we have the right uh, that we should um, be allowed to sell our organs. And the argument that I want you to make is we should be allowed to sell our organs because we should all have um, this right to make our own choices as concerns our own bodies. Okay, so it's the right argument. We have the right. I want it chunked up, chunked down, chunked sideways. Sorry, I was lost in thought. 
the more and more scary. <laughs> um, so within the selling organs debate, it's the one that it's the principled one that you have a right to make these choices about your own body. Good choice, 
to swap their money, um, to swap organs for money. Okay, and then a sideways chunk. You can do a really good sideways chunk here. You don't have to go that far away at all. You can do a sideways chunk where you say, think of all of the different places in society, ladies and gentlemen, where we allow people to take risks in return for money. We allow people to do dangerous jobs. Uh, we allow people, the construction industry has many, many deaths every year. Mining is a very dangerous um, profession. Uh, we allow people to be stuntmen and to be boxers, to do all sorts of things, which involves a choice between being paid to do something risky with their body. But most importantly in this case, ladies and gentlemen, we allow people to give their organs for free. So we do recognize that this is a choice that people are able to make over their body, that you can rationally choose to do this with your body. And we say that if you can assess that risk for free, then you can assess that risk when there's money involved. Okay? So you need, I missed out all that good stuff there that we heard on the chunk down, but I think that would be even more powerful if it had, if it was bracketed by the principle and the analogy. Emily, did you have a, a question? Um, well, just with this particular argument, I was thinking, because um, one of the things that came up in our debate was about how um, you give them, if you are paid for them, then people can start to bribe, like, not necessarily bribe you, but force you into donating your organs for money. Um, so I guess the sideways that I have gone with that would have been that right now you're allowed, you get money for your blood platelets, mm -hmm. and you can also get money for your egg and sperm donation. Yeah, yeah, so like excellent. So if you're already yeah. allowed to sell parts of your body, why not other parts? Yeah, those are really good parts. Or, or similarly, if you want to stay within that world, being paid to have medical tests done on you. Okay, to be human guinea pigs in medical tests. These are all really good kind of ideas of just trying to establish that this is, this is not something awful and shocking we're trying to do. This is very similar to all sorts of things that we do and accept within society already. That's why that sideways bit can be so powerful, because it can take this idea that maybe people are feeling not very comfortable with and make it seem more reasonable by showing them that it's similar to things that they already accept. All right, so when you do your debate this morning, try and go for it, okay? You're chunking up, chunking down, chunking sideways and um, see, see if you can do that, see if you feel that it helps you to go into more depth um, and, more and have more high impact um, with your argument. The one next thing I want to say before we um, uh, finish is the kind of bit that's, that's not the chunk bit, which is the last bit that I think you need to make sure you're doing to make sure you have that really high impact, is when you get to the end of that argument, whether you end here or whether you end here, make sure you finish some kind of statement which relates it back to the motion. Okay, which shows that not only is that argument right and true in and of itself, but give me that, and that's why you have to vote for us a bit, and that's why we have to allow those organs to be sold, um, because of this fundamental issue of liberty, or that's why we need this, uh, this affirmative action to solve this. So make sure you remind people, bring it back to that level, the most general level of all, I suppose, um, of, the, of the motion itself, um, in that thing that you finish. Okay? Um, and I hope that you find that that, that that does help you in that sense. Okay, do we have parents? Yeah, I have it. Boyan has yeah. parents. I'll put hand over to Boyan to yeah. parents for your final debates. Enjoy. Well, good luck.